morning. What a beautiful, warm morning, and my wife just loves this, and Chris comes in panting because it's so hot, and Bev just loves it. So I welcome you, and anyone that might be work, uh, watching online, I welcome you into our Lord's house this morning and to hear and to study God's word. Uh, if I, th I, I see some new visitors this morning. If, if your visitors haven't taken a chance to sign in our guest book in the lobby, we would appreciate that. But most importantly, we're glad you're here. And most importantly, please come back. This morning, I am going to give you some homework. Now, that might sound interesting. How many of you watch the news every day? We, I actually have friends that say they don't watch it anymore because it's so depressing. You know, and then I think, what is, what is going on in our society? So my homework for you is at the end of the day, when the hustle bustle of everyday life seems to come to an end, maybe it's when you lay down in bed at night, I want you to take a moment, after all this negative stuff we see all day, I want you to talk to God and thank him your blessings. You know, that might be watching your children or your grandchildren, and in my case, even your great-grandchildren grow up. It might be the nice thing that your neighbor or your friend said to you today. It might be remembering that near accident you had today, but God was there and it didn't hit anybody. and You were safe and sound but we don't take time to say thank you. So your, your homework is sometime today or tonight, take a moment and thank God for your blessings. Even this time of depression, we all feel depressed at times. I, th I thought this morning when Bev and I got up, we looked out our kitchen window we have a bunch of Cleome flowers that are just blooming, the pink everywhere. Our sunflowers are all in bloom, so you got big yellow sunflowers everywhere. And I just painted the roof of my bird feeder yesterday pink. It, it even looks pretty out among the flowers. That's God's creation. Take time to enjoy it. And that could be a challenge these days. But do think about it. Okay, some updates with church this week. First of all, we have birthdays. Joe Wilkinson's birthday, I think, is on Thursday. I understand his son is here visiting and they're having a big party for Joe at home. So that is nice. We also have Lee Eshelman, Nancy's uh, son, is uh, having a birthday, and Alex Sullenberger. So if you see any of them today, please wish them a happy birthday. A couple of other things, the ensemble is practicing right after church today again. And I'm assuming that's all leading up to August the 28th when we have our church picnic in the pavilion and then we're going to have music afterwards and that's what these ensembles are practicing for and singing and so on. Deacon's meeting will be Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. and regular prayer meeting is Friday at noon. Anyone is welcome to come to that. Um, I'm thinking that's all I've got on my list. Pastor, do you have anything? Good morning. I got stuff. I got notes. So a uh, few things here. Number one, I talked to Barb Baker this week. She has had her second knee surgery, and uh, this one has been a little rougher than the first, but she would welcome your prayers, and so uh, you'll hear me mention her this morning. Uh, Jeff is having some surgery tomorrow, and so you'll hear me mention him in the prayers this morning as well. Next. Now, let me get this straight. Two Sundays from now, and if you see me, by the way, if you see me playing with my watch up here, I'm not playing a video game, I'm sending Mark texts up there. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's still a ring up here. Um, but then uh, two Sundays from now is Spring Dam Sunday. And uh, Spring Dam Sunday, all the churches in Roaring Spring have a joint service down at the Spring Dam at 9 a.m. So we will not meet here two weeks from today. We will not meet here in the morning. So 
Uh, let's see, the camera, I'll wave at the camera and tell the folks who watch uh, from a distance. Two weeks from now, there won't be a live stream. However, there will be in the evening, we're look, we, we will have our normal morning service in the evening, outside, weather permitting, and we'll have communion. Uh, and so that'll eventually end up on the, on the YouTube channel, but no, no morning live stream that morning. So, for the Spring Dam service, two weeks from today, I'm the treasurer of the ministerium, so I have to come up with some ushers. If you could help collect, I, we'll have baskets and everything. If you are planning to be there and you have to bring your own chair, if you're planning to be there and you could help me by walking around collecting money from the community who gathers, uh, please let me know that. Uh, secondly, that same weekend, there is a community picnic down at the Spring Dam on Saturday, so that'd be two weeks from yesterday. And our church is going to have a, an, a, like a booth there. We're going to be giving some things away. And so uh, Kathy Harbaugh, John Hovenstein, and my Nancy, they're going to be, they're going to be there uh, giving stuff away. They're, they're working on some things to give to the kids in particular. They're looking for your talent. Is there anybody here who could make like balloon animals? Is there anybody here who could do face painting? Would you see either Kathy or John uh, after the service and let them know if you're able to help out in some way, some way that we could minister to kids? And um, at, on Wednesday nights at Kids Club, we have 10, 12 kids coming now maybe, which is great. And so they're, they're, we're really wanting to reach out to kids at the community picnic. So again, if there's something you could do to help it's from 11 to 2 on Saturday the 6th. Uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Uh, I am uh, booked after the service. Since the song service is coming up, I'd like to practice with the ensemble. And I also have some acolyte training to do after the service. So Pastor John's going to greet in my place. But if you need me, if you got something you need to talk about, come find me. I can take a moment for that. And I think... That is all I had. So, thank you. You know, I was just thinking, Pastor Joel is looking at his watch and sending a message. Let me tell you, this old man is a long ways from that ability. <laughs> <laughs> Does it, anyone else have any announcements they'd like to make? If not, our call to worship this morning is printed in your book, in your, and it comes from Psalm 16, and I would like us to read that together. Psalm 16, verses 7 through 8, printed in your, in your bulletin. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, and I shall not be moved. As we continue our review of the Heidelberg Catechism, it's the white book in your pew or at home. It is Lord's Day 30 that we'll be reviewing. It's on page 29. There are two questions. I will ask the question if you would please respond with the answer. Who are to come to the Lord's table? Those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. Hypocrites and those who are unrepentant, however, eat and drink judgment on themselves." Are those to be admitted to the Lord's table who show by what they say and do that they are unbelieving and ungodly? No, that would dishonor God's covenant and bring down God's anger upon the entire congregation. Therefore, according to the instruction of Christ and his apostles, the Christian church is duty-bound to exclude such people by the official use of the keys of the kingdom until they reform their lives. Our hymn of adoration this morning is number 336, O Worship the King, in your, in your hymnal. And when you locate it, would you please rise?
may be seated. Looking back at your bulletin, our call to confession comes from Acts chapter 3. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So our God gives us a gracious invitation that if we will come to him guilty, sinful, having offended him, and we will confess and repent and turn away from them, he will cleanse us. So let's take him up on that offer. Would you silently, privately make confession? Now let's confess together. Lord, we confess to you that we are displeased with ourselves. We have failed to imitate Jesus' love for us that is demonstrated in the Lord's Supper in that we have failed to vigorously pursue in our prayers and through tenaciously holding to the truth of Scripture the overall spiritual health and holiness of our church family. Instead, we have pursued self-gratification by coming to the Lord's table, seeking blessing, but not vigorously seeking to be made holy as you are holy. Grant forgiveness and purify us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if I could absolve you of your sins and do something to release you from them, I would, but that's not for me to do. That is only for God to do. But what I can do is I can extend to you from Scripture the assurance that God has heard you and he keeps his promises. So receive the, this verse, Second Chronicles 7.14, as assurance that God has granted you the pardon you've just asked for. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. Thanks be to God. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. And together let us pray. Lord of all power and might, graft in our hearts the love of your name and establish firmly in us true religion so that we will not budge under pressure from the world or fail to have compassion for those lost in the darkness of Satan's deceptions. We praise you for your mercy which you have lavished on us. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Daniel. So if you'll please take your pew Bible and turn to page 782. We will be reading from chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. I will begin by reading the uneven numbered verse, if you would respond with the even numbered verse. 
page 782, chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Nebuchadnezzar, the king made in the image of God, whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the said traps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the providence gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in sympathy with all the kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, for all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and symphony with all the kinds of music, all the people, peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace there are certain jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of babylon shadrach meshach and abednego these men o king have not paid due regard to you they do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abiyar to their... To, so they brought them these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, It is true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, etc., in sympathy with all kinds of music, <clears throat> and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, <clears throat> Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. In that case, and that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from the book of Ephesians. If you'll turn to page 1038, and would you, you are rise. I apologize for not asking you to rise as we read the Lord's word. Again, we are reading from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 on page uh, 1038. I will begin again by reading the uneven. You respond with the even. And you he made alive who were dead in trespass and sins. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our, fr of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. 
But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Blessed be the reading of the, reading of the Lord's word this morning. You may be seated. We will proceed with the children's sermon. So if the children would please come forward, and Mr. John is going to be your teacher this morning. Does anybody have the verse memorized? Okay, let's do it. Let's all do it together. Psalm 94, 12. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. Now, who of you here is instructed by God? Have you heard him? Yes. You haven't heard him speak, but you're instructed. Now, how are you instructed by God? By the Bible. And you know what else? The Holy Spirit works in your heart so you can understand the Bible. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. You guys like surprises? Birthday surprises and you like surprises in general? Well, I had a surprise this morning because I wasn't here last Sunday to see this, the bulletin. And I found out I had the children's story this morning. That was a big surprise. I would sooner a surprise birthday than, than that. But So anyhow, any of you guys know in Genesis, what, what day were whales created? Do you have any idea? Your battery went dead. Oh. I got a message. <laughs> I got a message. Okay. So, where was I? Oh, so my experience with one of the great creatures that talk about in the Bible was with a whale, a bunch of whales. I'll tell you the story, okay? We were up in Cape Cod on vacation, and we got there early. Well, we got there late. I got up early the following day. We had never been in this part of Cape Cod before. So I get up and I walked on the beach. And way, way up on the beach, I saw these humps in the sand. I thought they were just rocks. The closer I got, the more I realized there was a couple whales that had come up on the beach that night and were stuck in the sand. So I looked around, there was nobody around. The sun was starting to come up. So I figured I had to do something to try to save these whales. So I found a bucket and I got buckets of water and I started wetting these whales down with buckets of water. Hours went by and finally a couple more people came. So we moved the whales a little bit, the water, the tide was down, it was starting to come up, so the water got a little closer. And we're maneuvering these whales around in the sand. Finally, hours later, we got these two whales in the, in, back into the water and I got to swim around with the one whale. Two whales, they were they were called mink whales. One was 700 pounds and one was 900 pounds. So they weren't real, real big whales, but they were pretty big. So we got them back in the water and I got to swim around. I got to hold the whale and I got to swim around the water with it, which was really cool. And the one thing I realized some, uh, that happened that day is God puts things like that, experiences like that in our way to, to 
prayer. I mean, that was great. The one thing I thank God all the time for that experience because where else would I have been able to see two whales and swim around with them? God gives us opportunities like that. Well, that was our that was my first our first contact with whales on that trip. A couple of days later, we went on a whale watch, and we saw 21 humpback whales. A humpback whale is a lot bigger than a mink whale. A humpback whale is at least from here to the back of the church lawn. And we saw 21 of them. They come up beside the boat, and it was amazing. So the, the moral of the story is, in nature, God's created some amazing things. I would have never seen, never been able to swim around with a whale. I've seen pictures of them in books. We've all seen pictures. But to be able to swim around with a whale, to see them up close, that was God put me in the right place at the right time to really enjoy nature. And that's, Dan mentioned this morning, how beautiful nature is. We see it in magazines, but when we see it firsthand, it means a whole lot more. So God's, God's an amazing artist. And if we look at things up close, we've talked kind of about that in the past. But to see a whale up close, to look in the eyeball of a whale and know that God created that animal, that beautiful animal, that's, as Christians, we should really appreciate God's creation. Okay? So that's my off-the-cuff story today. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that we have the eyes to see uh, the beauty of nature around us, your creation. And not just to see it photographs, to actually explore places where those those creatures live and and to give thanks for sharing the earth with such beautiful animals. We pray in your name. Amen. All right. The artist thank you, John. The artist who created such um, beauty on this world has uh, instructed us, as Lindsay said, through his word. And uh, there are those in this world who reject his word, they, are, they do not want to be instructed, and sometimes they try to intimidate the church. So let's uh, sing Psalm 14 about the distinction between those who are taught by God and those who aren't. Would you please stand? It's on the back of your bulletin.
And Lord, I pray that you would make us wise to be able to explain our faith to others. Make us holy to be an example before others and make us loving so that we might have compassion for those who oppose you. Lord, teach us your ways and please uh, help me as I preach this morning, as I uh, work towards concluding this sermon. May it be useful for the building up of the body of Christ and pleasing in your sight, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So uh, we are really close to starting back into Isaiah, just a few uh, sermons away here, but um, this morning we're going to begin wrapping up this whole series on communism versus Christ, and then we'll go, I'll, I'll do one more sermon on how God is the author of liberty and freedom, and then, Lord willing, we go back to Isaiah 60, which will tell us more about what our future is going to be like. Some of you uh, may be familiar with a man named Vodi Bauckham. I've heard him speak at a couple of different conferences, and if you get the chance to hear him or read any of his books, I recommend him. His book entitled Fault Lines has given me a lot of uh, the framework of this morning's sermon, so we're, we're in the series where we're looking at uh, Marxism and Marxism with its atheism, it's a window. I, I think it gives us a window into how uh, Satan is at work in this world and what kind of hellish tactics Satan uses. We looked at Marx's life and how evil and wicked and filled with disgust it was. Uh, we looked at Marx's economic policies and how they differ with scripture. Then we, we've spent several weeks now looking at how Marx's ideas attach themselves to issues of race and they've exploited injustice so that they can stir up hatred. And then we've also looked at how Marx's ideas have connected themselves with uh, sexuality, and particularly last week we talked about Freud and how it can stir up hatred in our society. So we're gonna try to wrap up both of those streams today, both how Marxism has infiltrated the whole debate on race and how, what it has done to our talk in, in our culture about sexuality. So we're gonna bring, try to bring all of this to a close today. Uh, Vodi Bauckham, the fellow I'm, I was just talking about, he's able to trace his family ancestry back numerous generations and his third and fourth generation grandparents were slaves in North Carolina, Alabama, Virginia, and Texas. Vody was born in Los Angeles, but his parents' marriage did not last, and when busing began for the sake of integration in Los Angeles, he began to find out what it was like to be around people whose skin color is different than his, and to not be wanted, and to not be liked. So a couple of weeks ago in talking about uh, Marxism, I talked about a fellow named Alexander Solzhenitsyn who served time in a Russian prison, a Russian gulag because of the evil of communism. And he, he tells firsthand how wicked and how terror-like Marxism is. And I said that I think Alexander Solzhenitsyn has earned the right to be heard because of what he has to say, because of his experience under a communist regime. Well, I think that uh, Vodi has earned the right to be heard because of his heritage and because of his experiences. But one of the things that is different about Vodi is th than, than other, other persons that you might hear speaking about racism, and, and Vodi is a, a, a black man. One of the things that's different about Vodi is that he brings the Bible to bear on how we should think about matters of race. He points out that critical race theory uh, does not agree with scripture, and critical race theory, or I'll call it CRT, is more interested in protesting than engaging in constructive collaboration, and we've talked about that in prior weeks. He cites the Luskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA to show that a, um, a person uh, talking about CRT is not necessarily talking about you or me saying a racist thing or showing racist hatred, mocking someone or harming someone. CRT is not focused so much on individuals. CRT has moved the, the uh, 
the guilt from individual people who do wrong things to a system, an institution. So CRT is, has said that the entire American system is evil and it is based on white supremacy and white privilege. So everything that it means to be American, according to CRT, is evil. Uh, and uh, it, it's impossible to have a discussion on the matter with someone who holds to CRT because if you as a white person say, well, I'm not racist. I don't think racist thoughts. I don't say racist things. I've never harmed anyone of another race. That they would look at you and say, see there, that's exactly evidence that you're racist. So it's, like I said, it's impossible. That if the whole system in their mind is racist, then anything you say can and will be used against you. Ephesians 2, 13 to 16 is on your handout in the bulletin, which I left mine over here. Ephesians 2, 13 to 16 says, But now if Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, and thereby putting to death the enmity. So, uh, what this passage, these verses are talking about is that one of the sharpest distinctions that has ever existed in the history of human beings is the distinction between Jew and Gentile. It existed for thousands of years. And Ephesians, Paul is saying in Ephesians that God is able to tear down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile and bring them together through faith in Christ, bring them together to make them one body. So if God could do that, can he not bring together people of all races into one body, the church? Is the gospel not powerful enough to save uh, people who are of every ethnicity and no matter how much melanin is in our skin cells? Critical race theory is a rejection of the Bible's promise that in Christ, believers from all tribes and languages and nations and people can be united as one. CRT, instead, is more interested in hatred. It's not skin color that's important in the scriptures. It's the righteousness of Christ that we share and the spirit of Christ that will fill us all and teach us to love each other and forgive us for our former acts of hatred towards people who are different than us. Bringing many ethnicities together into the body of Christ will magnify the power of Christ to show that he can save people from all races, tribes, languages, and nations. It shows the, the depth of the creator who has created all and united his people together into a beautiful composition known as the body of Christ. The social justice crowd that gets a lot of press they would like to pass themselves off as the only ones in our society who are concerned about justice or that they have an exclusive angle on what real compassion is. But the history of the church, yes, the history of the church has bad things in it. That there were people who were in the church but not really following Christ who have done some bad things along the way. But you look at the overall history of the church and the church was about caring for orphans and freeing slaves and developing health care for people who had no access to it and reaching across ethnic lines intentionally to care for people who were not like yourself. History doesn't support the allegations of this group of CRT folks. Again, following the Marxist model of dividing society into two classes, the oppressors and the oppressed, CRT labels all white heterosexual males as evil and racist. That means that for me, in the view of CRT, there is no hope. This implies that Christ cannot save me. This impl implies that Christ cannot teach me to be loving. This implies that Christ cannot remove all my past sins because I am a white heterosexual male. Even if someone who is black like Vodi, who ought to be loved by the CRT movement because of his heritage, 
uh, even if he emphasizes the biblical model of family, which remember Marx wants to tear down the whole idea of family as the foundational principle of society, if, if Vodi preaches about family, which he does often, and he emphasizes that no matter what has happened to you, you have personal responsibility before God to do what is right, he's accused of catering to whiteness and being out of touch with blackness. Uh, so you can see that everything white is considered oppressive, and even if a black man tries to follow the Bible, he's called white as a, a slur. Malcolm X saw Christianity as a religion designed for slaves, and he saw black clergy as advancing the white cause. Black nationalism combined with Marxism becomes very hostile to Christianity. Those who are blinded by CRT never discover what Vody did. Vody discovered, as we read in Ephesians 2 this morning, that all of us, no matter what color, all of us are born in sin, enslaved to our passions, pawns of Satan. All of us are spiritually dead, and all of us need to find salvation through Jesus Christ. And that binds us together in one body. Vody was quite an athlete, and he was thinking about going into the air or making application to the Air Force Academy, but his uncle turned him away from that, and in October of eight, 1987, it, was, it, had been, it had grown too late for him to get into any big schools that had big athletic programs because all of their scholarship money was used up. So in October of 1987, he found himself playing tight end for New Mexico State University. And his first game, he caught 10 passes for 106 yards. And there was a fellow on campus who worked for Campus Crusade, and his name was Steve. And Steve had heard about this outstanding athlete named Vody. And Steve had heard that Vody was a great Christian. And so Steve went to meet with Vody and to have Vody uh, begin an evangelistic effort to reach football players. And Steve was talking to Vody about three minutes before he realized that he had been misinformed, and Vody might be a great athlete, but Vody knew absolutely nothing about Jesus. So Steve spent a weeks talking to Vody about who Jesus is and trying to introduce him to Jesus. And as Vody began learning, uh, they had this conversation. Steve said to him, uh, Vody, what do you think your chances are of getting into heaven? And Vody said, oh, I, I don't know, I think better than most. Vody said, I think I have a 90% chance or better of getting into heaven. And his, friend, his new friend Steve said, well, what if I could help you with the other 10%? And that worked on Vody. And for days that stewed in his mind, and he be, it began to become clear to him that he was a sinner just like all of us, and he could do nothing to save himself, and he finally confessed his sin and asked Jesus to be his savior. CRT would not allow that. It would be too white. <laughs> Any way of looking at the world that does not lead a person to Jesus for salvation is going to destroy the world and destroy people's souls. So therefore, unless CRT points people to Jesus, it's sowing seeds of destruction. Our greatest need is to be set free from the penalty and the power of sin, not to divide society into two classes of people and mount a revolution against those who are named as the oppressors. It was St. Augustine who said, a good man, though a slave, is free, but a wicked man, though a king, is a slave. For he serves not one man alone, but what is worse, as many masters as he has vices. So remember, we talked about this in prior weeks, that Marx and Freud and Rousseau, they're all about, they were all about the autonomy, that you answer to nobody but yourself. But that's foolishness, because they're missing the fact that we're all enslaved to our own sins. Vody points out that, yes, God does condemn injustice. And yes, injustice does happen in this world. All Christians should rise against it. So if, if, there is, if, you, if you come across injustice, you need to speak up. You need to take a stand. You need to come to the aid of those who are, who are having this offense of injustice committed against them. But God also condemns lies which are told to a society. On your handout there, Leviticus 
19, 15 says, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. So everything that's said or decided about what right and wrong needs to honor God's law, not someone else's law who is the, the, seems to be a very influential power like CRT. Regarding some of the great protests that we've seen in the news media in recent years, Vody appeals to the words of Nicodemus in John 7, 51, also on your, on your insert. Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? Proverbs 18, 17 says the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes to examine him. So what Vody is getting at is he's saying that not everything you see in the news is accurate. You're seeing one side, and you're seeing what people want to present. There is often a second side. I'm not going to go into details because I don't have the time, but I would recommend his book. He goes through and he, he lists, uh, for instance, one of the things he does is he goes through and he tells about terrible injustices committed by law enforcement officers. That no NFL player and no NBA player ever spoke about. They never protested. Why? Because the victim wasn't the correct color to fit the narrative. And so he's saying we need to stand for injustice no matter what color the, the person is. Uh, as Vody analyzes what he calls the anti-racism cult, he concludes that the way truth is mishandled really is like how the cults known as Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, how they twist and mishandle scripture. So what they do is Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Vody saying, so does the CRT group. They take words from the Bible, but they insert, they pull out the meaning and they insert their own meaning. So when we hear them use those words, we think, oh, I know what they mean, but they don't. They mean something different. Anti-racism, he says, offers no salvation, only a continual hate-filled demand for more and more penance to address a disease that is not curable except through Christ. The Bible says that we are all depraved. We are all in need of redemption. CRT limits depravity to white people. And white people are depraved. I know because I am one. <laughs> and I need Jesus. Jesus. But it's not just white people. And we will not all be united in Christ until all acknowledge sin and all come and bow the knee before Christ. The Bible identifies Adam as the federal head of the human race. Who, and through his sin, corruption spread to the whole human race. But not this anti-racism cult of CRT. They see that somebody invented whiteness at some point, And that's the person who's to blame for corruption that applies only to white people. White people have done and have said and have thought evil things towards other races. And if you are a part of it, what you need to do is ask Jesus to forgive you. And if you have harmed people of other races, you need to go back and you need to make reconciliation and you need to apologize and you need to make amends if, you've, if that's been a part of your life. You need to stand against racism. You need to be like Jesus. But I will tell you then, you cannot repent of being white. I, because it's not a sin. John 8, verse 36, I didn't put that one on the insert. It says that if the Son of God sets us free, then we are free indeed. But the gospel of anti-racism yields no freedom for whites. So it is an attack on the gospel. Not only is whiteness the new original sin, according to Vody, it's also the new unpardonable sin. The woke movement has moved the sin of racism from being committed by an individual to be structural or institutional. Therefore, they feel justified in having, as I said at the beginning, outrage against everything that is American. Now, maybe when you see that stuff, it makes you angry. Well, I would say, hold on. People who are blinded by CRT and kept from the gospel, they need Christ just as much as you and I need Christ. And your anger is not going to help them come to Christ. 
so we need to pray for them, love them, be patient with them, do not shout at them on Facebook, hold to the truth of the gospel with a yearning to see people of all colors come to Christ. So when you see someone on TV who is standing, because of their, their commitment to CRT, they are opposing the gospel of Jesus whom you love, you need to think, wow, I need to be united in one body with that person. Wouldn't it be great if God would save that person just like I was saved from my blindness and, and, and my spiritual deadness? Wouldn't it be great if God would save them and we could be united in one body? Those are the things we have to imagine, what God can do. Okay, so I said we're tying things up here. That's, that, that concludes what I'm going to say about how Marxism has infiltrated discussions on race. I just want to tie up a, a few quick loose ends here on how Marxism has affected, and we've, we've spent more time on this one, how Marxism has affected sexuality and those discussions in our culture. Because Marxism is always looking to, to say, oh, there's an, a group of oppressors and we have to have a revolution against the oppressors. We have to hate the oppressors. And what we said last week when we looked at Freud uh, was that Freud wanted everybody to have complete unrestrained sexual license. And he said, because of this blasted civilization, <laughs> he didn't say blasted, but I'm summarizing, because of this blasted civilization, you're not allowed to just act in an unrestrained sexual way, so you'll never be happy. So he said you could use drugs or alcohol or you could believe in Jesus. Those are things that you can do to try to get some relief. <laughs> it's a very sad system for Freud. But Freud, Freud viewed the biblical view of morality and the biblical view of family as evil. It's an oppressor. It keeps you from doing whatever you want to do. And so there you, you fuse that with Marxism, and now anybody who, who does not want to follow the Bible, what the Bible says about sexuality, views people like us as hateful and, and evil because we hold to what the Bible says. So I'm just going to give you three names uh, before I launch into the, the conclusion here. And I don't expect you really to remember these names, but I think that as we go through the history of how Satan has unfolded all of this opposition to the church and to his kingdom, I think that what it does is it helps you maybe to be able to recognize when you come across things in the news that, that after you hear them so long, they actually sound almost right. It, it helps you to recognize, wait a minute, that is opposed to the church. I don't want to invest myself in that. So let me give you these three names so that we can help uh, guard ourselves from being pulled off course. Wilhelm Reich was an Austrian who wrote in the first half of the 1900s, he's an important figure infusing together Marxist thought with Freud's ideas. And Reich saw the patriarchal family, this is a theme that comes up again and again. He saw the patriarchal family where there's a dad who's a head, leader of the family. He saw the patriarchal family as the fundamental union of oppression. And therefore the whole family structure needed to be absolutely eliminated. And you see that th this whole idea of family is so vital, Satan attacks it again and again and again. Reich advocated for the state to take control of children and to prohibit families from teaching their children what is right and wrong regarding sexuality. Reich saw that families were going to do psychological harm to their children, he felt, if they taught them what the Bible says. So this has bled over into society. We moved from focusing on physical abuse to psychological abuse. So you can have a baker who is, who, who, whose conscience does not allow him to bake a cake for a, a homosexual wedding and who he's not starving the people, he's not hitting them or harming them physically, but he's, he says, you know, because of my conscience, I'd like to take a pass and I'll recommend a baker across town. That's now no longer okay because the perceived harm now is psychological. But we must not be intimidated into hiding our convictions or violating our consciences because the God we serve is greater than the gods of this world. I said last week, I think it was, that there's a war against shame. And at first, the stance that was taken in this war against shame, the stance of the opposition, those opposed to the Bible, was it's nobody's business what consenting adults do behind closed doors. And then that was not enough. 
it had to go to the next step. And the next step is that um, it's no, sex is no longer a private activity, but it forms a person's very identity. Remember we said last week that when Freud influenced society, sex used to be something before him that was for procreation or for enjoyment, and now it's our identity. It's who we are, according to Freud. So this reminds me of Daniel chapter 3. We read that as our Old Testament lesson this morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were threatened with death with a very severe penalty if they insisted on clinging to their faith in God and didn't bow before the idols, the idol that the king made. You know, the world's putting up idols, and we're not here. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I don't hate them. I, I'm not here to uh, mount some sort of violent resistance. That's silly. That's not the way of Jesus. But they're not going to make me bow at the idol either. Because I look at what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were like. They're, they have to follow their conscience. From what I'm hearing, there are many parents who, because of the pandemic, were home to hear, actually, they actually got a chance to hear what their children were being taught in sex education classes. And it, for, for those who are really bought into this whole way of Marxist thinking, they're appalled at how many parents are pulling their children out of the school system now. The number just, I don't know about going to private schools, I don't have those statistics, but the number of homeschoolers has increased to, uh, I think, 11% of the whole population in our country. Well, Reich later in life became interested in UFOs, and he actually died in Pennsylvania in jail, serving conviction, uh, a, a time for a conviction of fraud, and he went insane. Secondly was Herbert Marcuse. He died in 1979. He was a German sociologist. And he also helped along this whole movement of trying to do away with the family and trying to give people absolute uh, freedom to do whatever they wanted sexually. And he, um, he promoted the radical left. He laid the, actually laid the foundation for them to where there has to be this trusted group of elite thinkers who can, regis who can rescue us dumb voters from what we learned in Sunday school when we were children. Uh, this school of thought cannot be convinced by logic or empirical science because they simply know that they are right. Deuteronomy 6, though, says we are to train our children in the ways of God. Last week we looked at Ephesians 5, which said that marriage between a man and a woman is to model the relationship of Christ in the church. The last name I'll mention is Simone de Beauvoir, and I don't speak French. If you do, you can fix that for me afterwards. She died in 1986, and she developed the idea that for a woman, biology is a form of tyranny. De Beauvoir popularized the idea that reproduction for a woman is not a fulfillment of her true identity, but an obstacle to it. She called for the body to be overcome and transcended by technology, and from her thought sprang the pretended distinction, the imaginary distinction between sex and gender. One whose sexual preferences are not affirmed by all is now named as a victim. It's not enough to tolerate people who want to make radical changes, that, that change must be almost worshiped. All must bow to the new idol. It's a blatant rejection of God's design. It's an attempt to replace it. Uh, the Bible celebrates motherhood. God gave a woman parts that a man doesn't have, and those parts are not for her benefit. She can live without them. They were given for the sake of the baby who might come, that might be produced in that womb. Uh, those organs are uh, given by God, designed by God for a baby. This contrasts with Darwinism that says that no, we're the result of a cosmic accident, and so therefore, we're free to manage whatever we want through technology. So again, we'll do one more sermon on this topic and look at God and scripture as the source of true freedom and liberation, but I hope that as we've gone through this series this summer that you can better lay, get the lay of the land of God, how God's enemies have formulated the battle lines against him and his kingdom, the tactics that they have employed because they sound, like I said, they sound very good sometimes. Uh, I hope you can understand how we got to this point as a culture, how Satan attacks what God has declared sacred, like life 
and marriage or sexuality, how Satan uses injustice in order to further his own agenda of hatred, how endangered many people are, especially our children, how crucial our role is to continue to hold out the truth in this community and in the world, and I hope that you have seen the beauty of Christ. Last week when we looked at Christ and the church and the beauty of Christ's sacrifice, or the very first sermon when we compared Christ with the ugliness of Karl Marx. And I'll conclude this morning with a few simple lessons from Dr. Alveda King. Alveda King is the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Her father was also a preacher, and her uncle, Martin Luther King Jr., said that there should be no white power, there should be no black power, only God's power and human power. Martin Luther King Jr. also said that we must learn to live together as brothers or perish as fools. That doesn't fit with CRT today. They would not accept what Martin Luther King Jr. had said. At 71 years old, Dr. Alveda King has a lot to say about race, but she also has a great deal to say about having converted from being pro-choice to being pro-life. And she advocates now for the unborn, just as she would call for civil rights for any group that is targeted for ill in our culture. She wants to see every American uh, have equal opportunity from the womb to the tomb. That's one of her favorite phrases. Her parents were engaged college students when she was conceived, and her mother wanted to terminate the pregnancy. Her grandfather, Daddy King, with Martin Luther King Sr., had a dream, and he said, I have a granddaughter on the way who has red hair and she's gonna bless many people. And so he convinced them not to abort little baby Alveda. When Alveda grew up, she had herself had two secret abortions. Then around 1983 or 1984, she trusted Christ as savior. She confessed her past and she's been pro-life ever since. And she recognizes that there is one critical race, the human race because we all come from one blood, which is Adam. Now, I just want you to absorb her attitude here. When she was asked if the pro-choice arguments get under her skin, she said, not anymore, because that used to be me. She has compassion. Yes, she's learning how to speak truth, but she has compassion because she sees in the people that are aborting, she sees herself, her former self. And she said, a woman has a right to choose what she does with her body, but the baby is not her body. Where's the lawyer for the baby? She said that babies that are not born are like slaves because they don't get to make decisions. So she's got good arguments. But I'll ask you again, I said it earlier, when you see people who are opposed to who we are and what the Bible says, yeah, sometimes you feel so angry. But I think we need to learn from Alveda. No, don't let it get under your skin. Those people need Christ, just like I need Christ. My anger is not going to help them come to Christ. So she engages with humility, with love, with compassion. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for your sovereign power. You are exalted over all the earth, even the people who oppose you, who hate you, who want to do away with the family, who trample on everything that you call sacred, like um, life or marriage. Uh, Lord, nobody can defeat you. You have triumphed by your meekness as a servant. And, and we don't, sometimes we don't want to follow that model. We want to get in somebody's face and we want to call them names. And, uh, but I think then Satan will be sitting in the background laughing hysterically because he'll have succeeded at causing us not to follow you. So Lord Jesus, give us compassion for people who are blinded by Marxist thought and Marxist ideas. And Lord, I pray that you would destroy all the kingdoms that are opposed to you, but save people out of them. Keep us from being rude. Keep us from uh, being filled with hatred. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would fill the earth with the fullness of your beauty and your glory. 
I pray that you would send the fear of you into, um, into our country so that nobody would want an abortion. Lord, I pray that you would reach kids who are being so confused by all kinds of messages that a, even adults are giving them about their sexuality. And Lord, I pray that you would rescue them and help them to learn what it means to, for a boy to grow into a man and a girl to grow into a woman. And for those who struggle, who feel so like they're in the wrong body, Lord, please have mercy on them and please grant them relief from that struggle that they feel. And Lord, help us to walk beside the people who struggle in that way and to care for them and to, to help them know you and love you and find that in you, they can truly find freedom. Lord, grant us faith to press on toward the full sight of your beauty in heaven. May that be our goal. Grant us courage like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had when the world around us would intimidate us and try to make us bow to its idols. Like I said, we don't want to be a jerk. <laughs> we just want to be true to you. Lord, give us competency so that when we engage in conversation with people, you, we know we have words to say. We, we've thought these things out and we can, we can offer scripture. And when we offer scripture, I pray that your spirit would work in them and teach them. Please continue to teach us Thank you for delivering us from blindness and deadness and bringing us into Christ. Lord, I pray that you would preserve our families in this congregation. Make us godly dads, godly moms, husbands, wives, godly children. And so may we show off the love of Christ to the community around us. Would you please bring relief in Ukraine and protect especially the church there? Would you please heal the racial divide in our country? And Lord, may we prove the CRT people wrong who say that we're evil because we're white. May we show that we are redeemed sinners who truly can love people of any other race. Build your church to be beautiful like you. Continue to bless family night and our ministry to children and prepare us for launching an after school program this fall. Lord, for those on our prayer list, I pray that you would continue to strengthen Barb Baker, give her perseverance in her, her healing, and for Jeff, as he uh, goes to surgery tomorrow, may all be well, and may, there, may it be a relatively simple procedure with nothing complicated about it. I pray for those grieving, the John Beard family, the Buddy Mattern family, may you come alongside them and strengthen them. Lord, I pray for our homebound members, and I think this morning particularly of Rilla. I pray that you would grant her much grace, and may she know the light of your presence. I think of those who are persecuted. I understand that in Nigeria there's horribly violent attacks against Christians. May their faith not fail, and may they even be a witness to those who are harming them. May they walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Lord, I pray for those we support in missions, Pastor Tomal and Vizier, uh, Jason Most and his family, and Melvin. Lord, please bear much fruit through them. And we lift up to you the names, these names that are on our hearts this morning. Father, thank you that you are compassionate. And you don't discriminate. You don't, you don't look at us and say, oh, well, this person has that sin. I'm not going to care for that person. Or this person is a certain color. I'm not going to care for that. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are so free and liberal with your love. You lavish it and splash it everywhere. Lavish it on us. And Lord, please have mercy on these whose names we've called out to you. Love them. Uh, deliver them from their trouble and, and deliver them closer into the presence of Jesus. If there's any who don't know Jesus as Savior, please may they be humble, just like Vody was that day in 1987. May they come to acknowledge their need of you and repent of their sins and trust Christ as Savior. And for those who do know Christ, may their faith grow deeper and wider and may you refine them and make them even more holy in their time of suffering. 
And Lord, may they know the sweetness of your presence with them. Lord Jesus, teach us to encourage each other. May we grow in our love for each other and for you. It has been um, very, I've been very grateful to have learned so much in this series. Now, Lord, help me and my brothers and sisters to live it. We pray all this in the, the name of our Savior, who is complete and able to help us. His name is Jesus, and we also offer the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And would the ushers come now to receive the offering? Jesus, thank you for all that you provide. You have given us truth. You have given us hope. You've prepared a place for us in heaven. You have provided for us all of our needs for shelter and clothing and food and companionship here on this earth. Thank you for bringing us together as the body of Christ. 
Lord, we can't repay you because we don't even have the capital on that kind of a scale. So all we can do is offer ourselves and our wallets to you. So Lord, use these, our, our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, use them to continue to benefit others. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, asking that you increase our witness in the community. Amen. Our last song is in the Little White Chorus book. So not in your hymnal, in this little book here. Praise, it says praise and worship on the front, number 54, Shine, Jesus, Shine. Thank you. 